There is nothing more enchanting, mystical, and mysterious than the experience of music. It has the ability to reach the very roots of our soul. And the right melody can transform our mood, bring us to tears of sadness or tears of joy and release emotions buried deep within the bedrock of our consciousness. Music unlocks the door to our hearts, allowing us to feel and embrace our innermost yearnings for connection and oneness that lies dormant within each of us, begging to be freed, begging to be expressed. And from the artist's perspective, music is the vulnerable expression of self. And from the listener's view, Music is permission to connect to the divine, to transcend the shackles of mundane existence, to experience something otherworldly. And many of us have our favorite song, our personal gateway to spiritual ecstasy. And with every note and every strum, our soul awakens and transcends ad infinitum. The Rambam states that had we not been gifted the Torah, we would have studied music in order to tap into spiritual truths. And yet, if one breaks down and analyzes a musical piece, they would likely be surprised at its apparent simplicity. Almost every song, especially Jewish songs, especially in Western music, follows the same simple two-step progression. The song begins with a low, steady buildup, progressively increasing in emotional intensity as it sets the foundation for what is yet to come. And this buildup repeats itself, again rising in intensity before bursting into the chorus, where the contained intro expands into a full expression of emotion where the soul erupts unfiltered, guided by the stirring melody and perfect words to capture the indescribable tune. And the chorus then reverts back to the lower intro and this process repeats itself, sometimes with a bridge, until the song finishes. This is the simple structure of a song. A circle, two low verses, two high, and repeat. Now, one would expect music, one of the most spiritually uplifting experiences known to mankind, to be more complex, more novel than a simple circle. And as we recently read Parsha's Hazinu, the Parsha both characterized by song and one that characterizes the Torah itself as one synchronized song, let us delve deeper into the concept of song and circles in order to develop a profound principle in Jewish thought. Because it's no coincidence that right as we read Parsha Shazinu, we also find ourselves entering the holiday of Sukkot, a holiday uniquely connected to circles and song as well. Every day of Sukkot, as we recite the Hakafos, we walk in a circle. And on Simcha's Torah, as we celebrate the completion of the Torah with joyous song, we repeat this circular process seven times over, walking in circles. So what is it about song that so enraptures the human spirit, and how is this connected to the concept of circles? You see, a circle represents spiritual death. It's a geometrical anomaly, as it's the only shape with no newness. No turns, no corners, no changes. A circle is a cycle that goes nowhere, contains no growth, and lacks any evolution. No point on the circle is unique. Each point is equidistant to the center, and a circle simply returns back to its starting point without making any progress. In actuality, a circle has no beginning and no end. But Judaism is a system that is uniquely founded on the concept of newness. The very first mitzvah, the very first commandment given to the Jewish people upon leaving Egypt was the commandment to declare the new month. Hachodesh hazelochem rosh chadashim. 
And why is this so? It seems like a secondary concept, not nearly as important as the mitzvahs of Shabbos, bris milah, and many other essential mitzvahs. But the answer is profound. Upon leaving Egypt, the Jewish people were experiencing their very own birth, their inception as a nation. And the Hebrew word for month, chodesh, also spells chadash, new. The Jewish people are a people who count by the lunar year built from months. Just as the moon constantly changes as it waxes and wanes, we are a people of newness and constant growth, waxing and waning through our endless evolution. The Western world counts by the solar year, which is based on the Earth's yearly rotation around the sun. And the Hebrew word for year is shana which also means old and comes from the same root as the word yashain, which means sleeping. It reflects the concept of repetition and mindless cycles and circles as the word shani means to repeat or to do something twice. And the sun does not appear to change, it remains static. And a life of shana represents a life spent spiritually sleeping lacking any growth or newness. In a solar year, the months are merely a practical way of breaking down the year, but in a lunar year, the months are the creative building blocks that come together to form the year. In essence, the Jewish system is built from 12 creative months, not a single repeating year. However, to understand the true ideals of Judaism and to reframe how we're meant to relate to circles, we have to briefly delve into the nature of time. The assumed and widely accepted understanding of time is that it moves in a straight line. Hashem created our world of space and time, and since its inception, time has moved inexorably forward. And along this line of time is the past, present and the future. And if we were to move backward on this line of time, we could peer through history and find Avram Avinu at the Akedah, Moshe Abinu receiving the Torah, and the Rambam writing the Mishnah Torah. Our current experience is taking place in the middle of that line, the present. And if we could move forward along the line, we would see events that have not yet occurred. However, there's a major challenge to this theory. There's a piyut in the Pesach Haggadah which states that Avram Avinu served matzah to the three malachim, the three angels who visited him because it was Pesach at that time. And Rashi quotes this opinion on the Pesukim in Bereshis and says that Lot did the same for the malachim, the angels who came to him in Sodom. Now, how can this be? The mitzvah of matzah originates from the events that occurred during the Etzias Mitzrayim. An event that would not occur for another few centuries. What is going on here? But to understand why Avram and Lot served their guest matzah before Pesach even occurred, we have to develop a deeper understanding of time. Time does not move along one continuous straight line. It actually circles around in a repeating yearly cycle. And as the Ramchal explains, Hashem created thematic cycles of time where each point in the year holds unique spiritual energies. And Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, all the Chagim are each associated with their own unique spiritual themes in time. And this deep understanding transforms our perception of time. We don't celebrate freedom each year on the 15th of Nisan because that's when the Jews were freed from Egypt. Rather, the Jews were redeemed from Egypt on the 15th of Nisan because that is Zman Chirisinu. That is the time of freedom. That power of freedom is what allowed the Jews to escape the slavery of Mitzrayim. And this is why Avram and Lot ate matzah long before the actual gula, long before the actual redemption, it's because matzah represents freedom. And Avram and Lot tapped into the spiritual waves of freedom that were inherent at that point in time. They weren't commemorating a historical event. They were tapping into the deep energies of, the, of time that was inherent at that point in the circle. And so too, we don't simply commemorate a historical event as we experience each holiday. Rather, we tap into the deep energies inherent at that point in time. 
And it's clear that time is not a continuous line, it's a circle. When we celebrate Sukkot, we're not commemorating history. We're experiencing the theme of Sukkot. We're connecting to Hashem on that deep level. We're sitting in a sukkah, not as uh, uh, some commemoration of a historical event that occurred thousands of years ago. It's happening right now. That is the concept of the circle. But even the circle analogy is limiting. Because if time were indeed a circle, then each point of the year would simply be a recreation and repetition of that point from the previous year and from the previous time around the circle. And that would be pointless. We just mentioned that we do not seek to re-experience the past each year. Our goal is to expand upon what we've created year by year. So that this year, when we return to that same point in the circle from last year, we're in a fundamentally different place. Every circus should be a different circus. Every Pesach should be a different Pesach. Every Shavuos should be a different Shavuos. And through our growth and ascension, we're able to convert the two-dimensional circle into a three-dimensional spiral, traversing along the same circle, but at even greater heights. We maintain the circularity while achieving ascension. This is the secret of a spiral. And the same is true for all spiritual circles. The ideal is not to transcend the circular system, but to uplift it, to transform it, to turn the circle into a spiral, to find innovative ways of creating newness within the circular system, not beyond it. And this is the concept of a song. Although a song may superficially appear to be like a circle where it has two low verses and two high and just repeats itself, a song is actually meant to be a spiral. The intro creates a buildup of emotion that explodes into the chorus. But ideally, the chorus does not simply revert back to the original starting point. Instead, the low part is now meant to be on a fundamentally different level, still riding the waves of momentum and energy from the chorus. And the low part is deeper this time. And you can feel the greater level of intensity. And then, as the low part builds up even more powerfully, it bursts into an even more powerful and explosive chorus. And this process can theoretically repeat itself ad infinitum. And as a matter of fact, as Jewish weddings of old used to dance around in circles, singing the same song for hours on end. They didn't just switch from song to song. They kept singing that same song again and again and again. Each time around, they would build the next rung in the spiral of the song as they built the next rung in their circular dancing. And this is why we dance in circles at celebrations and during the hakafos of Sukkot and during Simchas Torah. It's because we are dancing in spirals. We are ascending through song and spiraling spiritually as we do so. Each day of Sukkot, we build off the previous day's hakafa, climbing up one rung higher. And on Simchas Torah, after having built our spiritual staircase during Sukkot, we dance up all seven flights of our newly built spiral staircase as we accept the Torah in a transcendent fashion, the eighth rung, Simchas Torah. And we can now apply this principle to time itself. If time is meant to be a spiral, there is an apparent tension between two themes we just developed. The Jewish system of time is rooted in chodesh, chadash, newness, which is seemingly opposed to shana, the circular system of solar years. However, we have already shown that Judaism does not oppose circles, but instead proposes to transform them into spirals. If so, we must develop our understanding of shana in a much deeper way. Because in truth, our goal is not to transcend the realm of Shana, but to transform it into an experience of Chodesh, into an experience of newness within the realm of Shana. And as such, we create months within the year, newness within the old spirals within the circular framework. We don't pull the months out of the year but allow the months to uplift the year. And the same physical template of Shana receives the innovation and creativity that comes with Chodesh, that comes with Chodesh. 
And this is beautifully manifest within the word Shana itself. Yes, Shana means a year, it's cyclical and repetitive, but Beyond representing the mindless ritual, Shana also has another distinct meaning. It means to learn. It also means to change, Shinui. This is because when you add Chiddush to Shana, when you infuse newness into the circle, you create spiraling growth. You create newness within the circle, within the cycle. This is why effective repetition is the key to genuine growth. And yes, there's one glaring problem with the concept of linking the lunar year to the solar year, which is the math does not add up. A full lunar year is 355 days, and a full solar year is 365 days. So as such, there's a full 10 days missing if one unites the lunar and solar year. So how can we create this link? After all, Chazal, the sages themselves, sometimes use the solar year in regards to halachic matters, as you find in the Gemara Makos and Krisis and Yoma. So this would only make sense if we could successfully link the lunar and solar years together, bridging the gap between Shana and Chodesh, and thereby giving spiritual significance to the solar calendar. So how can we do so? So the Vilna Gon, in his parish to Sefer Ditzniusen, chapter 2, in Perek Beis, explains that the 10 days of the Aseris Simei Teshuvah, the 10 days of repentance, of returning to our higher selves, returning to Hashem, these 10 days serve as the link between the lunar and solar year. The judgment of the previous year carries over into the new year and remains in limbo until it's sealed on Yom Kippur the Day of Atonement. And thus the lunar year gets extended 10 days longer, linking the 365 days of the solar year to the newly created 365 days of the lunar year, allowing the powerful collusion to take place. And we now link the solar to the lunar year. We take the circle and we turn it into a spiral. And when one lives a truly holistic life, tapping into the true nature and meaning of existence, life itself becomes a song, a magical and immersive experience, a soulful adventure, a spiraling staircase. And the true beauty of a song is our unique ability to enjoy every note, every step, every stage in the progression. And if one learns how to live life like this, whereby every step was not only a means towards becoming something else, but was fully experienced, embraced, and treasured, then life itself would transform into a cosmic symphony whereby every aspect of reality played its notes and everyone around became redefined as a unique musician in Hashem's eternal orchestra. Music is powerful, but becoming part of the music is even more sublime. On the deepest level, as the Navi says, a true musician does not play the music, but becomes the music. And may we all be inspired to play our instrument, to contribute our song into the grand symphony of life, and to transform the circles of life into the transcendent spiral staircase leading towards our ultimate destination.